Okay. Thank you for that introduction. So, um, all right, let me get this. The way we produce and we eat food is about to radically change, I believe, and I think it'll have profound influences on our health and the environment. But with every technological change, as we have seen throughout history, there's always been opposition, uh, first with consumers and then, in some cases, from government as well. Um, let me just, okay. Uh, I really, this is my only disclosure that I have to make. Other than that, I'd like to thank my team of multiple personalities, because it's just me. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about opposition. Now, this is a, a phrase that I heard from uh, a member of the food industry, and I thought I, it stayed with me. Consumers don't want to eat technology. And I think that's true, that consumers, uh, for a lot of food technology, say, oh, well, this just benefits producers, it doesn't benefit me. And that, I think, is a large, in large measure why they uh, create this sort of opposition. And most recently, we see it in the clean label. And in my mind, one of the main proponents of this, and I'm sure many of you know her, is, I think it pronounced this right, Vani Hari, who's also known as the food babe. Uh, and she says, if you can't pronounce it, you shouldn't eat it. Well, that's kind of a little ridiculous. Um, but I'm going to argue that while this movement is current, I believe it will fade, because I think we've seen these kinds of movements to get sort of back to nature and natural uh, many times throughout U.S. history. So for example, in the 1850s when we had the Industrial Revolution with the steam engine and the cotton gin, electric telegraph. Uh, we saw this sort of desire to return to a simpler life. And then the, on the, uh, this is the Walden Pond. Uh, clearly, this was not to create a commune, uh, but just one person who goes back to nature, Thoreau. And then you had the Brook Farm up in, near Boston uh, was founded basically to get back to this sort of simpler natural life. And that's literally what we're talking about for food as well. And then again, in the 1960s, kind of when I was coming of age, uh, we had the same thing as Life Magazine here illustrates with the hippie movement to go back to, uh, uh, to sort of the simpler life. And it was really came together in 1971. There was a, a folk artist named John Prine who sang a, a song called Spanish Pipe Dream. And this is, this is the first verse. Blow up your TV, throw away your paper, move to the country, build you a home, plant a little garden, eat a lot of peaches, and try to find Jesus on your own. All right. So... It's been with us for a while, and I think this is sort of the natural fallout. And this is, uh, Marian Nessel says, uh, and I think lots and lots of people believe this, perhaps many of you in this audience do, in their largely unprocessed forms, foods from the earth, trees, or animals are by, healthy, are by definition healthy. Well, is that true? I mean, what that implies is that anything that is processed or hyper-processed or GMOs or anything is somehow sort of unhealthy. Uh, I, for one, don't believe that. And here's why. I regard nature as somewhat indifferent and certainly capricious. I mean, if you think about it, there is not one thing, not a plant or an animal, that competes to be eaten and to be healthy, right? Uh, Plants, for example, how they develop their own poisons. From Bruce Ames, we know that most uh, pesticides, nine, over 99%, uh, are, are natural with plants. They develop poisons. They have thorns, foul smells, and taste, anything to avoid being eaten. Animals, teeth, claws, poisons, quills, speed, and intelligence, anything to avoid being eaten. And we know, for example, that, that foods contain poisons. 5% of mushrooms are, are toxic, including the death cap shown here. Kidney beans contain uh, glycoprotein lectin, and if they're un you eat them uncooked, it can make you sick. Apple seeds contain cyanide, and nutmeg can be a hallucinogen. So what we have is we have basically um, this idea that somehow nature was created to make us healthy foods, maybe not quite right. And of course, some animals are better than others at uh, not being eaten. They, they are actually use their intelligence to get you to eat something else. So where does that bring us? So I'm going to argue that nature has created basically what we call a zero-sum game. A zero-sum game is one where I win, you lose, OK? If I eat you, you lose. However, what we are doing in foods now is we are creating what we call a positive-sum game. That's where if I win, you win also. And that's what markets do. So the markets that we see today 
We have people who are trying to create healthier, safer foods, as we, as we were talking about in this conference. And if you create a healthier, safer food, you're going to sell that food, and the consumer wins, and you win. So there's this huge distinction. So I want to push back on anybody who says, oh, well, you know, if it's, if it's, if it's natural, uh, it's better for you. Actually, I believe that we can make foods much better than nature. And I think that's sort of uh, one of the things that I want to push back on. Now, that's not to say that anything about markets conveys wisdom, knowledge, or virtuousness. There are always going to be mistakes happening from the lack of these things. But overall, we're going to be better off. So what are consumers interested in? Well, as always, and this will never change, it'll be taste, price, and convenience, right? If you're not competing along those margins, you're probably going to fail. But now we have this, all these whole new categories where people go, you know what, we're interested in a lot more than that. And a lot of them fall under the definition of sustainable. Uh, actually, I don't particularly like the word sustainable. I prefer, that for, the salute, for the problems that people raise, something that's discoverable. In fact, I just put out an op-ed yesterday on that. So I'm going to separate out obesity and diabetes because, in a sense, that actually goes beyond health as a, as a problem. But health, overall, chronic diseases, hunger, uh, the environment, animal welfare, and food safety are all concerns that people are looking at. OK, so let's start with how, are we, how is the food industry going to solve these things? And you've already heard a lot of these things. So I'm going to just give you a few examples. One of the ones that I'm really kind of excited about is 3D printing. So for obesity, one of the neat things about 3D printing is for each member of the family, if you have this in the home, it prints out the exact amount of food that you need to eat at that meal. So there's not this idea that, you know, you've got, as my parents did, you've got to eat everything in your plate because there's millions of kids starving somewhere in the world. Uh, geez, I wish they'd never taught me that. But it just prints out what you need. So uh, for obesity, this is one great control mechanism. The other one that I find sort of interesting is this kind of augmented reality. And this, we're trying to trick people into thinking that they're eating something either good or a lot, but they're not. So in the, in the uh, top here, this is something called Project Nourished I was reading about. It provides a sensory and visual experience uh, without the calories by reproducing aromas, textures, and chewing sounds. In the bottom, this is even more interesting, edible mist. It produces 200 flavors, right? And again, it's going to try to trick you into thinking you're eating something good or you're eating a lot when, in fact, you're not. Also for obesity, um, clearly, nutrigenetics uh, coupled with the Internet of Things is, is again, going to help. Um, and I've already experienced this. I, I tried uh, Habit, which was interesting, and I learned a lot of new things. And I, I learned the story of a couple who was using this kind of technologies who lost 140 pounds, and they fell in love again, which I thought was kind of cool. Uh, but the neat thing about this is um, when, you, when you combine these things, you're eating, again, just what's right for you, and it will help you choose food that will particularly uh, avoid g gaining weight and getting diabetes. So lots of uh, changes there. Let me go on to health. Again, I go back to 3D printers. Now, this may actually scare some of you, but uh, uh, I think we heard about, um, was it today or yesterday? I can't remember. But this idea of combinations, right? Because everything that we take into our body is, is a combination, and that's how we have to start to think about them. Well, people that are doing 3D printers are starting to think there's no reason that we can't print your food, your drugs, your vitamins, and your supplements all together, and, it, and again, combining it with nutrigenetics, it will produce exactly what you need, okay? And that's for each individual in, in a family. Or it can be, you can use the same thing in a supermarket. Um, so again, I think that's, that's coming, uh, and it'll be interesting to see how it uh, pans out. It, also for health, uh, again, with 3D printing, you can control the amount of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates to produce healthier foods. Uh, and it may be completely novel foods, things that we've never even heard of before. Okay, let me uh, go right on to uh, genetic engineering. So obviously there's been a huge pushback from consumers on uh, GM foods, genetic modification. Interestingly, we're already starting to see the same sort of pushback on gene editing. And by gene editing, I'm talking things uh, like CRISPR, Cas9, and Talons, where you're not taking DNA from a frog, for example, and putting it into food. You're just changing the DNA of the individual plant or animal. Um, and so, but what we find is, I, I've already found a number of examples where you can make healthier food. For example, you can, uh, you can edit foods to make higher amounts of antioxidant carotenoids. 
uh, or other cancer-fighting substances. You can certainly edit them to make fewer carbohydrates and higher fiber if that's what you're interested in. You can edit to get out trans fat, grow wheat with triple the usual amount of fiber. Um, you can reduce the amount of pesticides. One interesting thing that I've read uh, recently about CRISPR, for example, is that it's becoming democratized. It's all over the world now, and there's a, this is one estimate, there's 100,000 labs that are using this now, and with 10 people in each lab, so we now have over a million geneticists working with this technology. The other thing that's nice about it, obviously, it's good for the environment. We can edit plants to produce higher yields by making them resistant to weather conditions. So will we call this, or will we call this an organic or a natural pro process? Probably not. So let me just stop and talk about frankenfood. I find this to be a sort of a ridiculous claim, and yet whenever these things come up, this is the first thing that people will point to. Well, that's frankenfood. That's sort of messing around with what's natural. And I've already talked about sort of the problem with people who don't want to eat technology. I would argue that gene editing, uh, things like CRISPR-Cas9, has nothing in common with trying to sew together dead body parts and reanimate them. And in fact, it has about as much in common as bloodletting does to robotic laser surgery, right? So the idea that we call these things Franken-anything doesn't make any sense. In fact, for that kind of surgery, perhaps we should call it Franken-surgery. You could apply that to everything. Uh, and I, so this is one thing that I think it's time to really start pushing back on, just how precise these technologies are compared to this idea of a, of, of a Franken food that we are messing around with nature. Another concern for consumers, whoops. What happened here? Is hunger. Clearly, the world's population is growing. There's been, as you know, throughout history, there's always predictions. Uh, it goes back to Malthus um, that, you know, we, we won't be able to produce enough food and people will start starving, and then that will take care of the overpopulation problem. Uh, it actually never has occurred because technology has always come to the forefront. So, one of the things, and this is certainly not a new technology, is the idea that, as people are doing now, that we could sort of uh, start uh, feeding people more insects. Um, I'm always amazed by the insects, the list that I get, scorpions, tarantulas, termites, worms, weevils, caterpillars, and crickets. Well, those sound terrible, uh, but they're high protein. Now suppose you cr crunch those up into a powder and you use that technology that tricks you into thinking you're eating something better, whether the edible mist or whatever. So it's possible, again, new technology may find new sources of food like insects. Uh, again. Uh, CRISPR-Cas9 is going to help us engineer insect-resistant crops, uh, disease resistance, weather resistance, that they're going to use less water, so they're, in, they're going to increase yield. So it's technologies like this that are going to help us feed the world. Okay. We're moving right along here. The other thing um, that I think is interesting that's coming along is hunger. So one of the uh, things that a lot of economists are concerned about is what happens to brick and mortar malls when brick and mortar goes by the wayside because of Amazon or whatever? What happens to all, all the brick and mortar stores? Well, one way to re do, do something about that is replace them with a vertical farm. These are kind of neat. Vertical farms, they offer a year-round production. You can put them anywhere, including the desert. Um, they have no weather-related failures, and they offer sort of sustainability for urban centers. Now, the nice thing about them is uh, no agriculture or very little agriculture runoff, less use of fossil fuels, uh, use less land and water, about 70 percent, less fertilizer and pesticides. So vertical farms are sort of an interesting approach, again, for hunger. They, and you don't have the transport problem. You can put them right wherever um, people are, actually need the food. The other thing I think is kind of just beginning, this is Nemo's garden, is this whole idea of underwater farming. Huge areas that we can take advantage of. All of these things can go to eliminating hunger, and all of them are about new technologies. The last thing, and I think this is absolutely fascinating, again, not a totally new technology, but new for a lot of consumers. I don't think a lot of people outside the farming community and this community really understand about how great precision agriculture is. And with precision agriculture, uh, for those of you that are not familiar, you literally decide the amount of fer fertilizer, the amount of pesticides, and the amount of water by the square yard. Okay, and this uses uh, satellite imagery to look at, at your farms, and so you can totally cut the amount of water, totally cut the amount of uh, pesticides down really completely, and it, and it expands uh, your yields considerably. Now, this is a quote I heard. I, I, I don't want to vouch for the accuracy, but I know the, I know the direction is true. For the first time in history, we're giving up farmland 
to go back to the wild. And we're actually seeing new species being introduced because of it. And so the quote was, every two years, an area of farms roughly the size of Britain is abandoned because of, just because of precision farming um, and also uh, going back to cotton. But this is really interesting. We're actually seeing more wildlands growing because of precision farming. And so because of this huge increase in productivity, again, this is going to really help uh, with hunger. And, and this is happening. Obviously, this is something that appears to benefit uh, farmers, but um, it's good for consumers. The, the thing is, they don't know much about it. And I think it would be interesting if they did more. So a big one for people is the environment. Now, this is my pipe dream, OK? This, this, this isn't real. I made this up. Um, but imagine, for example, uh, that we did have 3D printers in the home. And instead of uh, having to go out to a supermarket or something and buy the, the ingredients, we just have it delivered by solar-powered drones. And not only that, we have smart homes. And the smart homes can receive them. And this, this solar-powered drone could be air or it could be land. You've seen the little land models. It delivers it. It automatically goes in your home. It ought, your smart home automatically finds a way to feed it to your 3D printer, and you don't have to do anything other than make sure that you pay for the ingredients and, and it keeps coming. So one of the things it does for the environment is a whole lot less fuel use, obviously. And again, with 3D printers, is a whole lot less food waste. So will something like that happen? I don't know. Uh, you're going to hear a lot more about uh, cell-based meat, poultry, and seafood. This is, I think, one of the more exciting uh, things that are coming along. The claims for cell-based meat, and again, this is meat, poultry, and seafood that is grown in the lab. It is not grown on, on farms. Uh, just to give you some examples of some of the claims of benefits, less greenhouse gas, some, somewhere between 80 and 98 percent reduction, obviously less land use. Uh, right now, animal husbandry takes up about 26 percent of ice-free land. Huge amount of less water use, 82 to 95 percent. Less energy use, less animal feed, uh, less animal waste runoff, and a sustainable food population all coming. Here's one of the reasons that I think uh, we're, we're, this is actually sort of the wave of the future. This statistic actually stunned me. I mean, you, you think, all right, well, people don't have to be consistent in their lives, but 90% of the people, uh, in this country at least, eat meat. 47% said we should ban slaughterhouses. Not sure how they intend to get there other than slaughterhouses, but clean meat is certainly uh, one way of going on. Now, eating meat is not going away anywhere soon. We've been eating meat for over 2 million years, um, but it has a, lot, a number of advantages, including which we have zoonotic diseases, which we might be able to eliminate uh, if we went to um, plant-based. Uh, <laughs> I just put this thing on the left because I just think it's so funny. They're young, they're in love, they eat lard. <laughs> I think that was from the 50s. Um, but we do see a lot of millennials now are, are definitely concerned about eating meat. Um, uh, and, and I think you just heard a projection that people are going to eat more meat. It's not clear to me what kind. 70% uh, of the world's population is thinking about reducing meat. It, meat consumption is down. Um, there are more people who are identifying themselves as vegans or vegetarians these days, and 26% of millennials actually think that they're vegans or vegetarians, even if they're not. Uh, but clearly this is a move, movement, I think, um, toward uh, uh, cell-based meat. And one of the things that's interesting to me is PETA. People for the eating, uh, what is it, people, not for the eating, <laughs> people for ethically treating animals. I always do that because I thought it was so funny. <laughs> Uh, they made very little progress, right? I mean, they, they have their sort of core group of supporters, um, but they've made very little progress in getting people to be upset about uh, slaughterhouses and so forth. However, if there's an alternative, I would predict that you'll hear a lot more from them, and a lot more people will be interested in that message. So that's going to be interesting to see how that happens. OK. Uh, let me turn to food safety. Um, blockchain. As you know, the food industry is not been really crazy about tracing back foods, but uh, this is kind of an interesting technology, and I think IBM has gotten behind it. Um, they talk about tracing back tr the time to trace back a contaminated food going from seven days to 2.2 seconds. Well, that does a lot of good things. Uh, one, one of the things that, that has always been a concern is when you have to paint an entire food category as a contaminated food product. If you can trace it back accurately, that eliminates all the other people from uh, consideration uh, and, and saves companies uh, millions of dollars. 
This, this also allows people in the, chain of, of the, uh, in the chain of delivery to say, well, has anything happened to my food that would affect its safety? So that's going to be helpful. And I think the other thing that hopefully this will do is when we can trace back faster, we have a better chance of discovering the root cause of the problem. And for me, that is a huge thing in food safety. Uh, I just read something uh, on the news about people are concerned about FDA is not in business doing inspections because of the, the holdout. But this doesn't involve FDA. So if we are, are better at figuring out the root cause of problems, those will wind up in more private food safety contracts. And the, the, the private food safety contracts is a much bigger network than anything FDA does. And, it, and they'll wind up in more private inspections. And what that means, ultimately, is that you're going to see the suppliers exercising a lot more due diligence and doing it wisely, because they're going to know what the problems are. So I see blo blockchain as having a huge impact. OK, second thing is robots. Uh, they're coming. I have no, no doubt about it. This is robots in a retail uh, situation. And we know that a lot of outbreaks do happen because workers do come to work diseased, because if they don't, uh, they don't often get paid. Uh, and I think a whole lot of outbreaks, we don't know how many do happen in restaurants. Uh, I think CSBI believes it's twice as likely. We know that one in four workers don't wash their hands or change their gloves the way they're supposed to. Uh, some come to work, they're vomiting or diarrhea. But the other thing is, you don't have these, these things can be programmed. You don't have to train them. In the United States right now, there are about 350 different languages spoken. And maybe in, in restaurants, there might be as many as 30. But that creates this huge problem for training, particularly when you have such a huge turnover in the retail uh, food industry, something on the order of 70%. And obviously, the other thing is, uh, you don't have to worry so much about accidents. Um, Finally, let me talk about food safety. We talked about nanotechnology, so I'm not going to go into that. But the nano packaging, uh, I think, is one of the really interesting things for food safety, where A, it can either alert consumers to the fact that their food is spoiled, or what's really interesting is I've read about nanotechnology smart packaging, where it actually sprays antimicrobials microbials, and actually fi fixes the food. So a lot of interesting things. So what's going to ha what's going to happen? How are, how, some of these things are going to come soon. Some of them are never going to come. Some of them are going to take a while. But why will food companies do these? Well, um, I don't think it'll necessarily be to appeal to consumers. Although that clearly works. That does create this consumer demand. Um, and I, I even less. I don't find it. It appeals to corporate responsibility. And I think another speaker made this point earlier. I mean, the first responsibility of corporations is unfortunately, to their stockholders, right? It's, it's to make a profit. Um, so my contention is that these, while they have some impact on whether or not you'll do these things, they are not, they're not the key. And the key is, goes back to Adam Smith. It goes back to your self-interest. Uh, and Adam Smith wrote this in 1776. So it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner. It's in regard to their own self-interest. So let me just sum up. I think the current fad the simpler labels and natural is just that. I think it's a fad. I don't think it'll ever completely disappear, but I think in large measure uh, it will. I do think that consumers will forever be interested in price, convenience, and taste, but they now have these other concerns like food safety, hunger, obesity and diabetes, health, the environment, and animal welfare. And I don't think it's going to be hard. I think for those people who are concerned about those things, it's going to be hard for them to resist these new technologies, despite calling them frankenfoods or whatever. So I think they're going to be more accepting of this as we go forward. There will be challenges, um, but I think that producers are ultimately going to listen to consumers, and they're going to find ways to profit by satisfying these demands. And cool, I'm a minute ahead. <laughs> Thank you.